Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on the basics of electrolysis. Now, before you watch this video, make sure you are confident on uh, how ions are formed, um, all the details around ionic bonding, and also how metals are extracted from their ores as well. Now, in this video, we're going to start off by recapping ionic bonding so that, that knowledge is fresh in our minds. Then we'll look at what electrolysis is, we'll look at the movement of ions during electrolysis, and then we'll look at how to predict the products of electrolysis for molten ionic compounds. And finally, how we predict the products of electrolysis for aqueous ionic compounds. OK, so let's start by recapping ionic bonding. Now, ionic compounds are made from an alternating pattern of positive and negative ions. Um, we call those cations. They're the positive ones. Remember, cations are positive because cats got cute little cat paws. And then we've got anions, they're the negative ones. And they form this three-dimensional pattern that we call a giant ionic lattice. And we can see that there with that alternating pattern of negative, positive, negative, positive, not just in two dimensions, but also in three dimensions as well. Now, in terms of their properties, um, the most important property that we care about in this uh, video is that ionic compounds, when they're solid, cannot conduct electricity. And the reason why is simply that the ions can't move. It's also worth saying that there are no electrons that can move either, but the ions not being able to move, that's the kind of key bit for this video. So we can see that if we look here, so if we just look at a two-dimensional slice of an ionic compound, we can see we've got these alternating positive and negative ions. And if we put, put them between two electrodes, so we've got positive and negative electrical supply there. This negative ion is attracted towards the positive and would want to move towards it, but it can't because it's locked in place by that giant ionic lattice. Equally, this positive ion is attracted towards the negative and would want to move towards the right. But again, the strong uh, electrostatic forces in that giant ionic lattice are holding it in place, so it can't move. And so because the ions in solid ionic compounds can't move, they do not conduct electricity. However, if we were to make the solid ionic compound into a liquid, suddenly now they do conduct electricity. And the reason why is that now the ions are free to move. And the reason why they're free to move is because the lattice structure here has been broken down. All the ions have been separated apart from each other and so they're free to move. And we can see that in this diagram here. So we can see the way that all these ions now, after the negatives can move towards the positive, and the positives can move towards the negative because there's nothing holding them in place because the lattice structure has broken down. And how do we make an ionic compound liquid? We do it in two ways. We can either melt it by very strongly heating them, or we can dissolve them in water. It doesn't matter which. As soon as we've made them into a liquid form, then these ionic compounds can conduct electricity. OK, so what is electrolysis? Electrolysis is breaking down ionic compounds into their elements using direct current, which is a type of electricity that we'll look at in a second. Now, the word electrolysis is actually made from two parts. The electro part of the word means kind of anything to do with electricity. And this lysis part of the word means splitting something up. So electrolysis, or just electrolysis, means splitting compounds up using electricity. Now, we said that it has to be this direct current. To understand that, it's worth um, learning a little bit about electricity. So there are two forms of electrical current. The first one is called direct current, which we often abbreviate to just DC. Now, this is the normal kind of electricity that you would have met in uh, other situations earlier in your education. Now, the way this works is you would have a negative terminal, you know, something like the end of a battery, and electrons are repelled away from the negative terminal and attracted towards the positive terminal, and the current will just flow in one direction, always from negative to positive. However, there is another kind of electrical current called alternating current. This is actually the kind of current that is supplied by the uh, wall sockets in your home. Now, the way alternating current works is that the negative and positive switch round about 50 times each second. 
And what that means is that, that the electricity, rather than just flowing forwards, it also flows backwards as well. And the electrons kind of vibrate backwards and forwards. Now, this does not work for electrolysis. Electrolysis cannot work with alternating current. So we need to make sure that we use a supply of direct current. Now, how do we do electrolysis? What's the, what's the setup that we need? Well, the setup that we need looks like this. Okay? And we call this an electrolytic cell. And in an electrolytic cell, we need a few things. First of all, we need our electrolyte. And we can see the electrolyte colored in gray in that beaker there. Now, our electrolyte is a molten or dissolved ionic compound. And it must be molten or dissolved so that the ions are free to move so it can conduct electricity. The second thing we need is a supply of direct current. We can see that here. That is our supply of direct current. This is often but not always something as simple as a battery, which, strictly speaking, we should really refer to as a cell if there's just one of them. And the last thing we need are two electrodes. Now, the electrodes are normally made out of carbon or metal, um, something that can conduct electricity, and they carry the electric current into the electrolyte. And we can see those two electrodes here, these big black sticks, these represent our electrodes. Now, there are two electrodes. The positive one is called the anode. We can see that here. So that's our anode. And the negative one is called the cathode. And again, we can see that here. Okay, so now we understand the sort of basics of electrolysis. We need to understand how electrolysis actually enables ionic compounds to break down. And to do that, we need to think about how the ions move during electrolysis. So let's look at the cations. First of all, those are our positive ions. Now, the cations migrate, that's a fancy word for move, towards the negative electrode, which is the cathode. So to remember that, we can put the two cats together. The cations move towards the cathode. Okay, And we can see that happening here. So we can see this positive metal ion, our positive cation, and here's our negative cathode. And the cation is moving towards the cathode. And the reason why is because opposite charges attract. Now, when the cation gets the cathode, it will be discharged. Discharged literally means to lose your charge. Okay? So our cations will be discharged at the cathode by gaining electrons. Now, why is that? Well, let's think about how cations are formed in the first place. Cations are formed by losing electrons. So in order to be discharged and lose their charge, they've got to get those electrons back. And so when they do that, they will form atoms of a metal at the cathode. And we can see that here. So there's a metal atom and there's a metal atom. And you can see they've both lost their plus sign, their positive charge, because they've been discharged. So what about our anions, our negative ions? Well, the process is the exact opposite. So what happens this time is that the anions migrate, that means move, towards the positive electrode, which is the anode. To remember that, we put the two ands together, so the anions migrate towards the anode. And we can see that happening here. And again, the reason why is the same. Our negative anions are attracted to the positive anode because opposite charges attract. Now, once they get to their electrode, the anions will be discharged. Again, that means lose charge. Uh, and this time, they get discharged by losing electrons. And let's think about why that is. Anions are formed by gaining electrons. So in order to, to discharge an anion, they need to lose those electrons again. So they lose them at the anode. And when they do this, they form atoms of a non-metal. And we can see that here. So that red atom there, that red atom there, those have both, both been formed by the anions losing electrons, losing their negative charge to become a neutral atom. OK, so now we understand a little about how electrolysis works. We need to apply our understanding to predict the products of electrolysis. And we're going to start with the easier one, which is predicting the products for molten salts. We'll look at um, aqueous solutions uh, in a little while. Now, we've got a, a really easy rule. The cathode, at the cathode, metal cations will be discharged to form metal atoms. So at our cathode, we will always form a metal. 
And equally, at our anode, which is the positive electrode, um, non-metal anions are discharged to form non-metal atoms. So at the anode, we'll always get the non-metal. You can remember that by putting the N in anode with the N in non-metal. So we get the metal at the cathode, the non-metal at the anode. Let's look at a couple of examples. Example number one is this one. This is the electrolysis of molten lead bromide. Now, in our molten lead bromide, you can see we've got these positive lead cations, and they will be attracted to the cathode, and they'll be discharged to become lead atoms. And equally, we've got our negative bromine or bromide anions, which are attracted to the positive anode, to become bromine atoms, or more correctly, bromine molecules. Now, if you're not sure about which one's the metal, which one's the non-metal, ionic compounds are always named in the same way, such that the first word in the name is the metal, and the second word is the non-metal. Now, you'll probably be familiar with a lot of these anyway by now, but if you're not sure, the first part of the name is always the metal. The second part is always the non-metal. Let's look at example number two. This is the electrolysis of molten magnesium oxide. So following our rule from just now, the magnesium is the metal part, because that's the first name, and the oxide is the non-metal part. Now, oxide is not an element, but oxygen is, and oxide is the ion formed from oxygen. So therefore, at the cathode, we're going to get magnesium cations um, being discharged to form atoms of magnesium metal. And then at the anode, we'll have our oxide anions being discharged to become oxygen atoms. So to recap, at the cathode, we always form our metal. At the anode, we always form our non-metal. OK, so now we're going to look at some higher tier material, which will help us to understand how we can predict the um, products of electrolysis of aqueous solutions rather than molten uh, ionic compounds. Now, the key thing to all of this is that in any given volume of water, about one out of every 10 million water molecules breaks down into ions like this. So a water molecule spontaneously breaks down into an H plus hydrogen ion and an OH minus hydroxide ion. So that means that in any kind of solution of an ionic compound, we don't only have ions from the ionic compound, but we also have ions from that breaking down of water into the H plus and the hydroxide. And those ions, the H plus and the hydroxide, will get involved in electrolysis in the right circumstances. So let's look at an example. Let's take, for example, sodium chloride solution. This is NaCl, Aq. Now, we are going to have Na plus ions present from the sodium, and we'll have chloride ions present from the chloride in our sodium chloride, but also we've got the hydrogen ions and the hydroxide ions from that breaking down of water. So actually, rather than just having two ions, we've got four ions. And you can imagine that will rather complicate things. Let's look at a second example, magnesium sulfate solution, MgSO4Aq. Well, our magnesium ions are Mg2+, and our sulfate ions are SO42-. So we've got those ions in the solution. But again, we've also got our positive hydrogen ions and our negative hydroxide ions from the way that the water is breaking down. Now, the hydrogen and the hydroxide ions can be discharged during electrolysis, which is why predicting the products of electrolysis of aqueous solutions gets more complicated. So how do we do this? How do we predict the products of electrolysis of solutions? Still higher tier material. At the cathode, if the metal is more reactive than hydrogen, then hydrogen ions will be discharged to form hydrogen gas. And we can see that here. So we've got hydrogen here. So all of these metals here, rather than um, the metal being discharged during electrolysis, all of these will get hydrogen being discharged to form 
hydrogen gas because all of those metals are more reactive than hydrogen is. If the metal is less reactive than hydrogen, then the metal will be discharged. So these ones down here that are below hydrogen in the reactivity series, for these ones, we will get the metal being produced instead. And then at the anode, we have a similar kind of situation going on, but we don't, it, it, it's not quite so clear cut. But what we find is that if our anions are sulfate or nitrate, then hydroxide gets discharged to form oxygen gas. And the reason why is because sulfate and nitrate are more stable than hydroxide. So hydroxide can be more easily discharged than they can. However, any other anion, then we'll get the non-metal being formed instead. So let's look at some examples. Uh, first example is going to be copper chloride solution. So copper chloride is CuCl2Aq. And we should know by now that chloride ions are negative. So we've got Cl minus there. And the copper will be copper 2 plus, Cu2 plus, like that. So we're going to have Cu2 plus and Cl minus and hydrogen and hydroxide ions present here. So what's going to get discharged? Well, at the anode, we're going to get chloride being discharged to form chlorine. Remember, chlorine is Cl2. And the reason we know that is because it's not sulfate or nitrate. And so therefore, the hydroxide is more stable. So we discharge the chloride. At the cathode, we're going to get copper, Cu2+, plus, being discharged to form copper, Cu. And the reason why is because it is less reactive than the hydrogen. So that's a nice, easy example that gives us the same products as if we were doing electrolysis of the molten salt. However, it won't always be that simple. OK, so let's look at a couple more examples. Um, this one, first one is sodium chloride solution, which is NaClAq. Now, the ions present here are Na plus from the sodium and chloride from the chloride in our sodium chloride. And then we've also got H plus ions and hydroxide ions from the water in our aqueous solution. So what this means is that the at the anode, chloride will be discharged to form chlorine. And the reason why is because it's only chloride. It's not sulfate or nitrate, which would form oxygen. So because we don't have sulfate or nitrate, it will just be the chloride getting discharged. At the cathode, though, we're going to see that hydrogen ions from the water will be discharged to form hydrogen gas. And the reason why is because sodium is more reactive than hydrogen. We've got our sodium right up here on the reactivity series compared to hydrogen down here. So because sodium is more reactive, it's harder to discharge it. So the hydrogen gets discharged instead. Example number three, sodium sulfate solution, Na2SO4Aq. So again, let's look at the ions present first. So the ions present uh, from the sodium sulfate, we've got the Na plus ions and the sulfate SO4 2 minus ions. But also because it's an aqueous solution, we've got the hydrogen ions and the hydroxide ions from the way that the water can break down. So at the anode then, because the sulfate is more stable than the hydroxide, the hydroxide will be discharged instead of the sulfate. And that means that we will form oxygen gas. And similar to the previous one, because the sodium is more reactive than the hydrogen, the hydrogen ions from the water will get discharged to form hydrogen gas. Now, our last example, and this is quite an important one, because this is one of the main ways that we can actually produce hydrogen gas uh, on like an industrial scale, is the electrolysis of water that's been acidified with sulfuric acid. So actually, we're looking at the electrolysis of water, but the sulfuric acid is going to help things along, as we will see. Remember, sulfuric acid, by the way, in case you've forgotten, is H2SO4. Now, in terms of the ions present then, we've got hydrogen ions coming from two different sources. Some of the hydrogen ions are coming from the water, and some of them are coming from the sulfuric acid. Then we've also got hydroxide ions from the water and sulfate ions from the sulfuric acid. So at the anode, because we've got sulfate ions and they're more stable than the hydroxide, hydroxide 
is going to be discharged to form oxygen. And then at the cathode, because we've got lots and lots of those hydrogen ions around, um, the hydrogen ions are going to be discharged to form hydrogen. And this isn't about reactivity this time. This is just because they are the only cations that are present. Okay, so that's it. The end. Um, as always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.